Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and do a quick introduction here and just get started in about two minutes after we go through everything. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, my name is uh, Jim Jansen. I work as an agricultural economist here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And uh, here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, we have what is called the Center for Ag Profitability, which is uh, basically the extension arm of the Department of Agricultural Economics. Some of the things we work on here relate to different types of surveys on land values, custom rates, and things related to that. And um, as part of that information, we are going to be continuing on with our Thursday noon time. Uh, our webinars are held at Central, Central Time Noon, um, webinar series on different factors or different types of information that are pertinent to the Center of Agricultural Profitability audience. Uh, please check out our full schedule at uh, cap.unl.edu. There's a diverse array of topics covered, so please uh, be sure to register for any of the upcoming webinars that are of interest to you. For today's webinar, we're going to be taking a look at land values, and maybe of more interest to some of the uh, attendees today, cash rental rates across the state of Nebraska. And each year, we estimate the agricultural value of land for the overall state of Nebraska on February 1st each year. And this year, we figured out the average came to about $3,360 an acre. It's about 16% higher than the prior year. And that's actually the highest value, not accounting for inflation or adjusting for inflation. It's the highest value we've ever had reported as part of our survey since 1978. So today's survey will be presenting to you on uh, taking a look at land values and cash rental rates. Uh, if you have any questions as we're going on along, I'm kind of a one-man show today, so I'll probably hold the questions until we get towards the end, and then I'll go through them in the order that they come in. So uh, please click on the Q&A box, and in the Q&A box, you can actually type in your question, um, and we'll try to address those as we're going along. And hopefully, if I'm good enough at trying to explain these things, maybe there, I can limit the number of questions. But by all means, we'll go ahead and get started. The slides from today will be posted as a PDF file on the Center for Ag Profitability's website where there are a complete list of all the different um, archived webinars. So be sure to take a look there. You can find any of the charts, numbers, figures, whatever it might be. Okay, with that, give me one moment here to switch my screen over. And... Okay, so I believe I'm sharing my screen and everything is being recorded. So if there's any issues, Ryan, please let me know, but I think we're good to go otherwise. And uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started from there. All right, so each year we do an update on the annual Nebraska Farm Real Estate Survey and Report. I am Jim Jansen. My contact information is found on the left-hand side of this slide if you'd like to visit one-on-one -on -one with me via email or phone. And uh, the endowed chair of finance here at the University of Nebraska is Jeffrey Stokes. Uh, he also works on the Farm Real Estate Survey and together each year, it's a lot of fun doing this survey, but we get to work on the annual survey of land values and cash rental rates across Nebraska. I uh, want to give a special thanks to uh, Zag Land Company. They were willing to help sponsor today's presentation and provide some monetary funds to help continue on with our survey work, help cover the cost of printing and mailing out our survey. So please uh, contact Sam Zock and uh, he uh, can help you out with any of your land management uh, consulting needs. Uh, great, uh, great person, and we appreciate him for uh, allowing us to. Uh, sponsor our, our outreach today. Okay, so the first thing today, each year we do our annual farm real estate survey. Who do we survey? Well, the first bullet point highlights it, but it's mainly people that work in the Nebraska land industry. This includes agricultural appraisers, farm and ranch management companies, agricultural bankers, uh, brokers, other people that work in the land industry, people that would have firsthand knowledge on the transactions related to land sales or cash rental rates. Uh, traditionally, during the second week, between the second and third week of March, it depends how the calendar falls, we do what is called the preliminary estimates on land values and cash rental rates. 
That's the first snapshot on land values and cash rental rates. And then the final report is published in June. That has a lot of additional detail beyond the preliminary estimates, which the numbers are usually very similar between the preliminary estimates and final report. There's a lot more information on things related to what are the expectations for future land values? What are the um, uh, demographics in terms of who's buying, who's selling land? Um, some of those type of things. As always, where can you find updates? Uh, the Center for Ag Profitability website, cap.unl.edu. And then for the real estate information, add a slash on there, the same slash where your question mark is on the keyboard and type in the word real estate without a space. So that's where you can find the current report in addition to all the archive reports we were able to track down as a PDF. So what we do each year and what we will probably continue to do into the future is we take the 93 counties we have in the state and we subdivide these eight counties into what we call agricultural statistic districts. And agricultural statistic districts are regions that share similar production attributes. Uh, for those folks that are aware of the word crop reporting district, that is the same region in the state. There's eight regions. These regions share what we call per, uh, similar production attributes, so expectations for rainfall, crop yield, soil type, um, some of the major features that impact crops, what is the norm of the region. And uh, from that, we take 45 million acres of ground we have in this state, about 23 million acres is either grazing or hayland, the remainder of the balance, a little less than 22 million acres is cropland. And with that cropland, we have about eight and a half, around eight and a half million acres of irrigated cropland in the state. There's more irrigated cropland in Nebraska than in any other state, including our neighbors to the south of us, such as Oklahoma, Kansas, or Texas or even California, so that really sets us apart. So with that being said, we subdivide the state into eight different regions. Uh, the East District, uh, we're broadcasting out of Lancaster County, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln today. Lancaster County is located in what we call the East District. In the East District, uh, you'll notice Lancaster County somewhat goes into the Southeast District, and this is a good example to show just because your county is in one uh, district, the numbers might follow another region a little bit closer, especially if you're in one of these areas where you kind of follow the, um, you know, if you're on the county line or you have kind of a unique setup with the way the counties are set up. But once again, uh, eight districts and the information will be summarizing today. We're going to start kind of at the regional, even state level, down to the region, down to the full county. And then the final examples will try to motivate you in the decision making you are facing, whether a landlord or tenant to actually set a cash rental rate on your farm, okay? All right, so some basics here. What you will see today, I'm not gonna cover every slide that I have in my slide deck for the sake of time. What I will do though, is we will post all my slides. I'm gonna, you, you will see if you look up my slides, I hide quite a few of them on the different types of land just for the sake of time. But a few things to know. First of all, the slide we have right now is all land, ag land value. You created an average accounting for all the different types of land, whether irrigated, dry land, crop land, grazing land, and, or hay land, and you created kind of an overall average for the region. What you see is what we have up here right now. So for the overall state average, all the 45 million acres, which is a little less than 45 million acres, but it's pretty close to it. The overall average was up about 16%, uh, $3,360 an acre seeing a little bit higher rate of increase than the eastern third of Nebraska, the western two thirds, it kind of depended where you're at. And um, we estimated these market values as of February 1, 2022. It's always the current year compared to the prior year. So with this breakout, we have, uh, and you may have seen other news releases from other organizations or companies, and there has been some sizable increases reported. What are the reasons really leading to some of these sizable increases? Uh, the first thing that we have here, uh, what is the value of what we're doing? And what I mean by that is what is legally permissible on a property tends to relate to the value of the property. An example, 
Uh, I picked the price of corn here and listed it in red and uh, the value of land here in blue. The value of what we have relates to the value of what we can do on it. And there are some very, you can't help but notice some of these similarities last time we seen this back in that 2012 and 13 period. We're somewhat about roughly 10 years from that. One thing we noticed, the marketing year average price of corn peaked once. And then we dealt with it being uh, in that three and a half to four dollar range for uh, three, four, five years, and then it slowly crept back up. And uh, what do we notice is anytime we have these extreme fluctuations in price where we see it set a high price and then land kind of has a lagged effect from that. But without a doubt, even with rising input expenses, uh, land not adjusting it for inflation is following some very similar trends and it actually set the highest price we've seen. What's interesting, and I don't have it in this slide, if you adjust for inflation, meaning if you took all the land sales for the, have been recorded as part of the survey and said, what would the land be worth if you put them in terms of 2022 dollars? The highest price was actually in 2012. So inflation is a concern right now. It is one of the motivating factors in why people are looking to hard assets, tangible things to deal with inflation. One of the other factors that our finance professor here on campus talks about is the cost of borrowing. Now, I use a 10-year treasury yield rate. I'm not suggesting you can get a land loan for 2%, for example. But 10-year treasury yields, uh, the markets are very liquid. There's a lot of activity on this type of security traded each and every uh, business day. And with that being said, if you want to talk about a downward trend line, we can talk about interest rates. And uh, there were periods in the 70s and 80s when we had extreme inflation issues where we had to raise the interest rate or the interest rate was raised to deal with that. Obviously, that caused issues with the farm real estate markets. But generally speaking, interest rates have trended down over time. And one of the motivating factors on why people are taking a look at land or why they may have taken a look at purchasing land over the last couple of years or even refinancing agricultural debt uh, is the ultra low interest rates. I recently wrote an article for the Center for Ag Profitability in one of the companies where you can get a land loan at. Uh, I wrote a very similar article about a year before that. And the article I noted uh, for a 30-year ag land loan right now, the interest rate was around 6.0 to 6.2%. Prior year, it actually had only been 4%. Now, you may not think of 2% increase in the cost of borrowing year over year for an egg land loan is a lot. But if you amortize, if you think about all those future payments you have to make over the upcoming 30 years, interest does start accruing. So the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to combat inflation. Question is, how is that going to impact land? All else equal, if we don't see higher prices, I'm not exactly sure. I do feel that the, currently the loans that have been made and the ability to, for producers to lock in long-term debt at a fairly favorable interest rate, we're in a much better position than when we were back here in the 70s and 80s when we had uh, financial crises and things of that nature. The one strong thing is, is over the last couple of years, the loans that were made for very expensive land tended to be fixed rate loans at a fairly favorable interest rate. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, and this is, I believe this is the second year, I'll be going into the third year here, that this has been taking effect. Many people have expressed to us through our outreach that property taxes are a concern for real estate owners, whether agricultural land or um, um, household residential properties. And uh, as part of a ballot proposition, we legalized gambling in the state of Nebraska based on the votes that were in favor of it. And uh, part of that uh, revenue generated, or a fairly sizable chunk of the revenue generated from gambling, is going to be going towards property tax relief for residential as well as agricultural land owners in Nebraska. And one of the websites that I found that had a really good write-up on this credit is from the Nebraska Farm Bureau. So if you go to NF b.org and take a look at their website. I think they even have a tab or a link on there where they have different publications on the topics related to real estate taxes. 
a brief overview on what uh, what's all entitled in here, or what's uh, what's all in their article. In the state of Nebraska, if you own agricultural land or a residential home, and you also file a state of Nebraska income tax return, not a federal, but a state of Nebraska income tax return, a portion of the real estate taxes that goes towards supporting the local public school entity, wherever your property is, a portion of that, 25.3% of the portion over the share that goes towards the real estate taxes for the public schools will come back to the landowner or the residential homeowner as a property tax credit, not a deduction, but a credit. Even if you're retired and maybe don't have income coming in, you can still file a tax return and get this credit because you still have to pay real estate taxes even if you're in retirement. This credit, I believe in the prior year was only around 6% and it's, you know, it's slightly over 25% now. So that's a fairly sizable increase. So once again, this applies to only to the portion of real estate taxes um, associated with the schools. And if you have any kind of a bond opt-out vote or something like that, uh, the credit does not apply to that. But once again, if you have not filed this with your taxes going forward, definitely take a look at this. This is a credit that can really add up for landowners. Uh, a few other things. I'm going to note two slides here on land values. Uh, obviously, with the cattle industry, drought is a major concern right now, as well as the cost of feed to expenses. We did notice land values increasing, but the increases, you know, there's several where they're, while they were almost near 10%, they weren't near that uh, double digit that we've seen for cropland. So once again, the value of what we do, the profitability of what we have ties to the value of trying to acquire those resources, whether it's through the purchase of land or renting of a real estate property. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out, uh, the one that's always a very much of interest, is center pivot irrigated cropland. And overall for the state, we've seen some fairly robust gains for overall for the state. The state average is up to $7,730, up about 17%. Other areas, especially Northeast Nebraska, noted a very strong increase there. Uh, you're getting what, fairly well over 10,000 in the east and right at about 10,000 here. So a lot of interest in purchasing real estate. Summarize what we talked on. Profitability, even with higher input expenses, the anticipation of higher prices for the crops we're growing right now was one of the leading factors. And two, cost of borrowing is very favorable. Now I recognize it has increased even in the last week, it's gone up some. But uh, many of the land purchases made in late in 2021, leading into 2022, uh, there were periods where you could gain very favorable financial terms for the cost of borrowing and debt associated with it. When you take our survey, there's a set of questions. It's on a scale of one to five. And for the purposes of making a nice slide here, I kind of normalize the information here to say, if you're right along the center of the slide, it means no impact. But we ask the people that work in the land industry, what do you anticipate land values are gonna be doing over the upcoming year? Over the upcoming year, if you see the line from where you're seated right now, if the lines are shifted to the blue to the left, um, that means we anticipate prices to be declining. If they're shifted to the right, anticipated prices are going to be increasing. Some of the things we talked about so far include current crop prices, uh, interest rate levels remain very popular, uh, very motivating factors, uh, popular reasons why people are engaged in the purchases of real estate. Uh, one other interesting thing, I had a land broker made a comment to me that works for a real estate company here in Nebraska. 1031 tax exchanges. A 1031 tax exchange is basically where you take, let's say you inherited some ground in Iowa and you farm in central Nebraska. You can sell that ground in Iowa, turn around and take the proceeds of that sale and reinvest it into your land purchase in Nebraska. And has limited taxation implications or kind of like trading land. You can do it with homes or other types of real estate. But they said, according to their sales, 58% of their sales over last year, either the buyer or the seller 
had been using some type of a 1031 tax exchange. So they either were motivated to sell or buy based on the 1031 tax exchange. Water availability, um, some of these other things are also motivating factors. It's interesting was I had an updated presentation I did back in 2018 with a very similar slide to this. And this slide almost was flip-flopped, this tornado slide. And it had a lot different economic picture. And that's what makes our egg industry always so interesting is how are the factors guiding the decision-making and the uh, future real estate values we have associated with properties. All right, so, so far we've briefly covered what's happening to the market value of land in Nebraska. And in addition to the market value of land in Nebraska, we also mentioned some of the changes occurring associated with uh, real estate taxes. Be sure to take a look at that credit if you're eligible. And also where do we think kind of land where might it be headed in the future? Now we'll step into cash rental rates. And uh, once again, if you got questions, you have two options. One, you can type them into the chat. And uh, you can type them into the chat and you can also type them into the Q&A. So I'll try to keep an eye on that and address them as we're going along. And the one other thing, Ryan Evans, our media specialist here at the department, he typed in, if you wanna find the real estate report, he actually typed the link into the chat on where you can find the real estate report link. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and go forward and um, taking a look at cash rental rates. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start large, we're gonna step down to the county, and then we're eventually gonna step down to the farm. So to begin with, overall, the dry land average cash rental rates for dry land, when I say dry land, that's not uh, cropland that is not irrigated. The 2022 season, uh, overall, we've seen certain pockets here in the east, we know it's only 7% increase, but uh, either single digits here, sometimes double digits in the western part of the state. But keep in mind, 11% change on $33 an acre. You might be talking around $3 versus, say, a 10% change on $245. You're talking over $20 an acre. So it really depends on where you're at. And relative to where you're at, how does that impact the uh, percent change? So keep that in mind. So. If you are talking about, if you wanna know what the percent change was, you have to understand where do you stack up? Where does your property align with respect to, um, where does your property stack up against some of the regional averages? And with respect to the regional averages, let's talk here in the central district, for example, you'll see on your screen, we have the acronym HAL. And HAL actually stands for the high, high grade, low grade, and overall average. And with respect to the high grade, uh, that's a high third average. With respect to the low grade, that's low third average. And overall average is the average. So with that, we see the breakdown here. So an example, the upper third average was 145 an acre. The low third average was 105. And the overall average was 120. We do not account for distinguishing the type of yield soil type or rainfall. We simply ask the question, what do you estimate the low third averages? What do you estimate the upper third averages with respect to cash rent? Another source of information that's done independently from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is done by the USDA. The USDA has a division called the National Agricultural Statistics Service. It goes by the name NAS. And uh, they do also do survey work related to the egg sector here in Nebraska. And they do a survey on cash rental rates. And I would encourage you, if you want to look up this information, there's a website link right here where you can actually go look at different stats like uh, average number of head of cattle in a county in Nebraska, cash rental rates, uh, certain crop yields. And um, my understanding is they are doing a cash rental rate and their information, the map that we'll see on the next slide will actually be published the second week of September. I want to point out this is for the 2021 cash run rate season for the growing season. And uh, the breakdown that we have here, this is by county. Now, a few things I'll point out. If your county's in white, uh, with that county being in white, what that means is 
is that uh, they don't have enough people responding. An example out here in the sand hills, we don't have a lot of non-irrigated or dryland cropland. So if you get a survey, be sure to make it out because those surveys do impact what is being reported, but also availability of information. The reason I present this slide is one, I want you to be aware. They do publish the raw numbers in late August. So if you went to their database, you can actually find the numbers. But that full-blown map, it usually is about the second Friday in September when I typically see it appear on their website. The reason I bring this map to everyone's attention is, especially in the more dominant crop growing regions of the state, an example here in the Southwest, you can kind of gain some insight on how the cash rents vary. You can see that maybe Lincoln and Frontier or Red Willow are maybe in the upper third of cash rental rates. And some of these counties here to the western part are maybe a little bit more in the lower third if you follow some of the numbers from the prior slide here two slides ago. So we kind of think of them somewhat as our cookie cutter slide to gain some insight on how do cash rental rates vary around the hyper region. On the topic of irrigated rates, the University of Nebraska reports either gravity or flood irrigated rates in addition to center pivot irrigation rates. And once again, these rates assume um, a breakout by the high grade, average of the low grade, and then the overall average for the area. And with the overall average for the area, uh, you can see here, and I uh, just give a breakout here by the different types of land or by the different grades, but you can go find the percent change when we post the full slides. Uh, you can gain some insight on how cash rents vary. Now on the irrigated rates, whether for gravity irrigated or center pivot irrigated, the survey assumes that the landowner or the landowner entity owns the entire irrigation system. If the landowner does not own a portion of that system, you would discount the cash rental rate to account for that because the tenant would be bearing some of those expenses. On the topic of center pivot irrigated rates, a percent change year to year. The breakout that we have to, once again, um, you know, when we have 175 an acre, a 16% change relative to a 10% change on 300 and some, you always have to keep in mind the base number. So the eastern part of the state was fairly well over 300. Western part of the state, you're either central, you're kind of in the mid to high 200s. In the western part, you get into the high 100s. So that's the breakout that we have here. And the breakdown, uh, so what influences cropland cash rental rates? Uh, I failed to mention this on the dry land cash rental rate side, but on the topic of dry land cash rents, obviously the configuration of the field. So do you have a nice square field? Do you have a field that is cut up by a ditch or a ravine or a valley that you can't farm? Uh, do you have a nice quarter? Do you have a 40 acre parcel? How desirable is it to farm it? Well, it's probably going to be influenced by the configuration of the ground, the type of soil. Uh, there's certain pockets in the Northeast that have very dark soil. You get into Cumming County. There's other areas, maybe in the Western part of the Northeast district where the soil is a little bit lighter. Crop yields tend to reflect some of those differences, even if it is irrigated, as you still need to have some water in the soil profile to make it go at it, even if you'd intend to irrigate. On the center pivot irrigated cropland, how good of equipment do you have? Do you have an irrigation system that you can turn on and off with different types of technology? I'm trying to hold my phone up here. Or do you have a type of system that is older that still works, but it requires a lot of upkeep? Who's providing the upkeep to the irrigation system? Depending upon who provides the upkeep to the irrigation system, that can have some impact or influence on some of the cash rental rates. On the second irrigated on the breakdown by county, uh, SDA is divide out uh, gravity or flood irrigation rates versus center pivot rates. So, an example, if you're along the portions of Interstate 80 here where there's still a fair amount of gravity or flood irrigation, an example, Hall or Buffalo County, I'm just making up an example here. If a third of the county is uh, gravity or flood irrigated, the weighted average are going to weight this. And if you noticed, gravity irrigation rates tend to rent anywhere, you know, maybe $30 to $50 an acre less than what center pivot does. 
So with that being said, if they create kind of a weighted average, that weighted average is going to account for some of those differences between the two, kind of the two types of land. Okay, so that's a breakdown here. And once again, if you're in an area where there's maybe not a lot of irrigation, with that being said, the cash rental rates are, may not be published. Or in some of the example, Douglas and Sarpy County, you're in the Omaha metros. Lancaster, you're also in the Lincoln metro. So it really kind of depends where you're at in the breakout that we see related to that. I'm going to step briefly into pasture or grazing land cash rental rates. Uh, the pasture rental rate, uh, you can either rent by the acre or by the head or by the pair. We rent by or by the animal unit. The information that's reported by the University of Nebraska is either by the acre or by the pair. When it comes down to the acre here, what we see is that um, cash rental rates generally trended slightly higher. Some areas a little more, some areas a little bit less. But the challenge we face as a livestock producer is if expenses associated with feeding cattle, especially in the drought situation that we're in. And uh, with that, the pasture rental rates, we have a breakdown here once again of the high third, low third, which we call the high and low grade, and the overall average. Now, with these breakdowns, um, what influences grazing land cash rental rates? Some of the major things that influence grazing land cash rental rates include the quality of the property, you have, you know, do you have a nice, nicely configured pasture? Do you have a pasture that's being overgrown by cedar trees or other brush? Who's controlling the noxious weeds or brush? Sometimes it's a retired landowner, sometimes it's a tenant. Uh, Alan and I always joke, uh, Alan Vanalek and I, we go out and do land management workshops and we always say it's the other party because some of these tasks are not the most enjoyable thing to do. What I would encourage you to negotiate, if you are an older landowner, you have a tenant that's willing to work with you and address some of the issues you have with, with respect to the controlled noxious weeds, rebuilding the fences. Account for that in the cash rent. So if you, especially in the eastern part, when you're in some of these areas where you get some fairly high cash rental rates, how can you adjust? Can you maybe discount the cash rent so many dollars per acre or maybe consider a lower average cash rent? to account for that contribution that the tenant is making to the property if they help clean it up. USDA has a breakout here on uh, cash rental rates by county. I uh, think you'll notice attending in every district, the further west you go in it, you tend to see uh, lower cash rental rates the further west you go because we tend to have less rain the farther west we go in the state. Also, certainly in York County, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of grazing land in York, Cass, or Sarpy counties. Uh, you're either in a metro area or a very heavily irrigated area, some of these areas here. Other counties where there is grazing land, if they didn't get enough responses back, they can't publish a number. But once again, you kind of use this as your cookie cutter slide with respect to gain some insight on, you know, what counties you know, there's certain counties, certain regions that tend to rent at a higher rate than what some of the other ones do. So trying to kind of build on information and understand some of the numbers. This slide here, I forgot to make an update quick. This is not per head. This is actually per pair. I'll make that adjustment and when we post the slides, it will have the corrected slides. And uh, Ryan might be able to put the corrected uh, slide in here in this part of his editing of our presentation. But for one cow, one calf, for one pair, for one month during the summer grazing season, the breakdown that we have here is, um, you know, an example, roughly $60 of per pair in the central district. If you take 60 times five, so let's just call it 60 for easy math, that would be 300 per pair for a five month grazing season. Uh, some folks want to rent for, they, maybe they put more pairs out, but they only rent for three months. Well, let me work with that. Uh, some folks, because of the drought in certain areas, they might take 150 day, a five month grazing period, and they might convert it over to a daily rate because maybe only run livestock out there for 100 days or 120 days. Uh, you can kind of work with that, some of these numbers, but the reasons I mentioned on some of the differences that we have on cash rents right here. Also, I would believe hold true to 
uh, some of the reasons that we see a breakdown in the differences related to fencing, weed control, who provides the water, who's paying the bill if you have an electrical hookup at the site, who's paying that uh, monthly bill every month. Those factors all impact the cash rental rates that we see. I want to speak briefly here. Uh, so let's talk back up for a second. So far, we've talked about where land values, where have they been, where are they headed in the state of Nebraska. Second part, we briefly reviewed what I call the regional and county cash rental rates. The final piece here, we're going to talk about some of the trends in cash rental rates and how do you actually think about how do you make that decision on what should I be offering for cash rent or if I make, made an offer, is that a good idea or not? We'll give you some ideas to think through here. Three different ideas on how to estimate cash rental rates. Out of these three examples, my preference is probably towards the second one, but I do see some arguments on why people might use the first one. So let's get through them. The first idea here, let's say you look through some of this rental rate information and you see in your county, this is just a made up example, let's say your average county cash rental rate is $190 per acre. You're also able to maybe visit with a crop insurance agent and gain some idea on what the average county corn yield is. You take $190 per acre and divide it by the average yield, you get what is called the county rent per bushel. What this says is for every bushel of grain raised on rented ground, $1.42 is going towards what? It's actually going towards the cash rent. It's $1.42 a bushel a lot right now if you have six or seven corn. Well, it may be not quite so much right now, but during the pandemic where we had periods where corn was only $3 a bushel, that's a fairly high share of the sale price. At any respect, we take this number and slide it to the upper right-hand corner right here. And uh, we actually look up our farm's APH. Over the last 10 years, what's our farm typically yield? Well, in this made up example, our farm only yields 119 bushel. If you take the county rent per bushel and times it by the typical yield, you get the an example of farm level cash rent. We take what we know on the left-hand side of the slide, and then we apply it to what we don't necessarily know on the right-hand side. We don't know what the cash rent could be or how to adjust it. So we take what we know, the county rent per bushel, and we multiply it by the typical yield associated with the property, one way to arrive at the farm level cash rent. Um, with respect to cash equivalent from crop share, uh, another idea on how do we set cash rents? Uh, well, the first easy part of the slide is what is a crop share? Many folks are aware of a crop share though, under that deal. Traditionally, the landlord gets a portion of the crop and the tenant gets a portion of the crop. With that, when the tenant gets a portion of the crop and the landlord gets a portion of the crop, uh, typically, especially if it's a 50-50 crop share, the landlord is probably going to be paying a certain uh, amount of, the, an example, the seed, fertilizer, and chemical expenses. And after that, they stand to make so much an acre. So if we took a crop share and made it a cash rent or a cash equivalent from it, you, know, you kind of ask yourself, what's the opportunity value on uh, what's the next best alternative for a crop share? Well, it's probably gonna be cash rent or roughly what I stand to make off that crop share. So I draw up three different scenarios here. If you roll the clock back to March when a lot of people are negotiating cash rents or even February, on my field of corn, I anticipate it's gonna grow 100 40 bushel per acre. And remember, this is for new crop, not the old crop prices that had $8 this past winter, but for new crop corn, the crop that we're going to be harvesting here in hopefully October or November, the price per bushel is $5.90 a bushel. Now let's say my field yields 140 bushel, but the landlord and tenant evenly split the yield, so each party gets 70 bushel. Now, the landlord and the tenant each get half of the income generated per acre. So in this example, it's $413 an acre. And in addition to that, they're also splitting half of the seed, fertilizer, and chemical expenses if this is dry land cropland. I actually looked up one of UNL's crop budgets that I felt was somewhat representative of an example if you're raising 140 bushel. And I'm well aware there are areas um, we could probably use some higher 
input expenses, but some people did prepay some of those expenses last fall and were able to lock down their input prices a little bit more than what people were having to pay out of pocket this past spring. At any rate, the crop budget information is available with Glennis McClure here at the Center for Agricultural Profitability. If you want to find budget information, um, you got to take a look at the Ag Budget Calculator, and inside there you can get some of the budget information. So if we take the landlord or tenant share of the income minus their share of the expenses, half of the seed, fertilizer, and chemical, the difference between those two is what the landlord, I understand they still have to pay real estate tax, but they anticipate they'd make about $220 an acre. You have to pay real estate tax regardless if you even have um, cash rent or if you have a crop share. So the second example here, we get to July and prices are up, uh, you know, roughly 50 cents a bushel or something. And they holding the expenses steady, assuming they didn't change any. The cash rental rate, the opportunity value on the ground, if you did cash rent instead of a crop share, about 254. You actually get through to harvest and uh, prices are down a little bit for whatever reason. And once again, holding expenses steady, then under this example, the cash rent could have been 214. So, so there's really three different examples here on how you can uh, take a look at cash rental rates. And uh, people ask, which is a fair cash rent? Well, I would probably hesitate to say that, you know, what actually happens to the crop yield prices, input expenses? If you have to lock down that cash rent in the spring, if it has to be paid, or a portion of it has to be paid in the spring, one thing you can do is play with the scenarios. Play the what-if scenario on the yield and the price. Those are usually the two dimensions of risk here that we don't know what's gonna happen. I would anticipate a lot of people probably know where they're sitting at with some of the major inputs. Not so much necessarily with the major income. And the final idea here, cash equivalent from hay share, uh, the final idea from cash equivalent from share, uh, I think we had a question come in here on uh, cash leases. And uh, when it comes to how do we figure out a cash rent, let's say there's a lot of properties, even in rural crop country, where you have 20 acres of grass around, say, a farm site, for example, how do you figure out what the cash rent should be on that? Well, if you would put the property up on share, meaning there's two examples here. Landlord, in this case, gets a third of the yield, tenant gets two thirds, or a landlord gets half the yield, tenant gets half the yield. So if you take their share of the lease, the landlord's share, and if you know what that hay is worth per ton, I just picked a number of 120 a ton. Under the left-hand example here, uh, the landlord's not paying any of the expenses because they only get a third of the hay. But under this example, the cash rent could be a, a little less than 100 bucks an acre. And on the right-hand example, let's say you decided to put out $50 worth of nitrogen this past spring when prices got so expensive, but they also did get more of the hay. Well, this is another example to show depending on how much risk the landlord wants to take on, that does have an influence on the cash rent. So keep those factors in mind when it comes to negotiating cash rent. The reason I like this example is if you're in a dry area, maybe the yield is not as good as what we have displayed here. Maybe the prices are higher if the yield isn't as good in the area. You can plug in what you want into this simple formula. I don't have to tell you what this is, but this is a way to kind of calibrate. If you have an unusual parcel of ground that you're cutting for hay, that's one way um, that's one way to negotiate some of these things. And the final example on return on investment, with respect to return on investment, land is an investment and every investment has a return. If you take that return and multiply it by the market value, I tend to see uh, folks that are really sharp for finance, so like egg bankers, this is maybe a calculation they do or agricultural appraisers. If you take the capitalization rate, which we do report on this in table five, take the cap rate times the market value, that can give you a breakdown on the cash rental rates. So three different approaches. No approach is more right or wrong, but I do feel 
when you look work through some of these numbers, um, this is just one way to figure out these things. And the uh, thing that we took a look at in uh, 2022 as part of our survey, we had exceptional input expenses. We asked the question, did people make any switches to different leases to account for some of this uncertainty we had because of uh, COVID and economic issues that we had transpiring this past spring? Well, that was basically the question we asked here. And about 8% of the leases, they went to a crop share. We did see a lot of interest in what we call a flex lease, and we aren't covering that in today's presentation, but we've seen a lot of interest in there. And we also seen a lot of interest in just uh, not doing much, but just staying with whatever you had in the prior year. And also, uh, this is kind of an interesting slide. I've never seen anyone else kind of do this for Nebraska. We took a look at, let's say there's three major lease arrangements across the state. You have a crop share, you could have a cash lease or a flex lease. And with respect to that, uh, what do you estimate in your area of Nebraska for your agricultural statistic district? What do you estimate the proportion of um, leases are in your area? Well, we tend to see, especially in the Western, when we get to maybe a small grain country, so where they where you raise wheat or some of those things, we tend to see more crop share. When you're in the Eastern part of the state where it's heavy row crop country, you do still see some uh, crop share, but we tend to see a lot of cash leases. So the type of risk in the area, the willingness of the landlord and the tenant to negotiate, sometimes it's requiring the use of a crop share to share in that risk. Uh, something that's a little bit newer are flex leases. And a flex lease is kind of the same thing if you would merge, if you would put together a cash lease and a crop share, that's a, a form of a flex lease. So that's the breakdown that we have right there. And uh, just two slides here on flex leases. If you put together a flex lease, what are people flexing leases on? Well, the breakdown that we have here, majority of people are either flexing based on crop price or a combination of crop revenue, which is a function of yield and price or crop yield. And with respect to the people that are flexing leases based off of price, uh, what are they flexing it on? Well, a lot of people use the crop insurance price guarantee or futures, futures price. Maybe they look at the futures price over a certain period of time. There's still a lot of people that use the local cash price. So that's a breakdown on flexible cash leases with respect to um, how we see this impacting uh, our determination, our decision making on what we should be using for prices. And the price, if you're choosing to flex off a of price, these are some of the different prices you can use. I know some folks, I've been getting calls over the last few days on terminating verbal leases. And if you do not have a lease in writing for the protection of the landlord and the tenant, I highly encourage if something happens to either party, consider using a written cash lease. You can afford one, you don't want to see an attorney about this. Take a look at aglease101.org. You log onto that website, click on the document library. It brings you to this page. Uh, you can get PDF leases where you can actually type on them. If you don't do the typing very well on a computer, just print them out and write on them. A uh, few other things I wanted to point out. Once again, thanks to Zag the Land Company with Sam Zock over there. I appreciate him for uh, helping us out today. And uh, if you'd like to contact him, his information is on the bottom of the slide and he has a website there. It's zag.ag, it's not .com, but .ag. And it's uh, Sam Zock is the individual's name that has up that company. And uh, final thing with some of the rising expenses we're seeing with postage and printing and whatever else, if you're someone that would be interested in helping us continue on, we plan to do this well into the future, but uh, we have the University of Nebraska Foundation has a small fund that helps cover our annual mailing expenses and uh, printing expenses associated with doing the survey. And uh, if you find this information valuable, if you're willing to help us out, any donation of any size uh, can go a long way. So um, 
We have a representative with the University of Nebraska Foundation with their contact information right here if you'd like to reach out to them. Or you can simply just go to this link right here and it takes you to the University of Nebraska Foundation website. And there's a way on there. I think you can use a credit card or even a checking account if you'd like to make a donation that way. But uh, anyone that's helped us out in the past, we greatly appreciate that. And anyone that would like to help us in the future, and even if just using our information, we always look for engagement with public. And uh, this is a good way to get involved with uh, some of the work we do here. So please consider, if you would, um, making any donation, and it helps us out a lot into the future. And uh, finally, we have a couple of meetings coming up. Uh, our current land management pilot series that we have right now is called So You Inherited the Farms of Malawi. And with this program, we're taking a look at farm inheritance, land management issues, just not for landlords, just not for tenants, but anyone that if you're thinking about it, if you're getting older in life, got inheritance to, that you're gonna have to pass to someone, great program to sit down. It's about three hours long. Um, we have a sponsor for, for all the meeting locations to cover the cost of lunch. The only cost to use your time and you gotta call and register. We have to make sure we have enough seats in the room but we also have um, enough food lined up for each meeting. So please, uh, if you'd like to attend, these are free and open to the public. And um, I know the Round the Bend Steakhouse, I think they have a little bit more seating room than what they do in Columbus. But um, Lancaster County meeting already happened. And I do believe with the Ashland meeting, if it works out, we hope to record that meeting with our media specialists that day and eventually post it to our website. And now, well, I will be there in addition to Helen Benalik to uh, host this meeting. And we also have land management quarterly coming up. It's over a week away. We'll be covering some somewhat similar things that we did here, but we'll also be having Alan Benalik on to talk about uh, communication issues and things related to that. So please uh, register for it. Just do a search on the CA. Website for Ag Land Management Quarterly, and you should be able to find. Uh, and you can actually submit a question there too if you have one. So, with that, I will. You see the question slide is here. We still have a lot of people on. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start going through the questions in the order that they came in. And um, Ryan also posted if you like to provide a little feedback on today's presentation, um, we can take care of that. All right, so what I'm going to do, I have questions typed into the Q&A and also into the chat. I got six and I got about seven minutes left. So if we go a little past one, so be it. But I'll try to answer these in a, an appropriate fashion. So the first question we asked had asked, um, we have a cash lease for hay and uh, it must be on a verbal lease in Nebraska verbal leases, if you wish to make a change to the terms of your verbal lease, you are technically supposed to provide a termination notice. I would suggest in writing, I do not have an example letter, but you can write one yourself, contact an attorney. And uh, if you wish to make changes either to the rate that's being paid, whether moving it up or down, the tenant, the landlord, whatever, you need to let, um, you need to let that individual know, you need to let that individual know prior to September 1, I would suggest, I think it's through certified mail and also through a common phone call or in-person visit. You need to let them know on the, if you wish to terminate that lease. And that's with respect to the verbal leases. If you have a written lease, whatever the termination clause is in the written lease is what you need to follow. Okay, next question we have here is, what are the three components of input costs that should be shared between the producers and the landowner when it comes to a crop share? Uh, you mentioned, uh, so kind of the big three on dry land cropland that we tend to see under a 50-50 split be shared between the landlord and the tenant, or excuse me, between the landowner and the operator or the tenant. Uh, we seed, or the seed corn and seed soybeans or whatever you're planting, fertilizer of various kinds. And when I said chemicals, what I mean by chemicals are, it could be herbicides, pesticides, foliar application of things. Uh, those are tend to be the biggest three, especially on a 50-50 split. 
If you're on a one third, two third, or a 40 60, you may not necessarily be splitting those expenses into the proportion of the lease. All right, uh, a lot of good questions. So if you need a few minutes past one, thanks for joining us. But uh, uh, next question here. When are most cash leases, uh, cash rental rates signed? In February, spring, later in the year? How does a one year lag in information help determine cash rental rates if you're trying to set it for 2023? All right, so let's talk about a few things. Cash rental rates based on my call volume, I see cash rents getting set throughout the year. I do feel that the majority tend to be set in the springtime. Um, when I say set in the springtime, sometimes folks around or prior to March 1, I do see some folks, uh, they, they have a verbal agreement. You're gonna rent my ground next year, which allows a tenant to go out and uh, acquire the necessary or prepay some of the necessary expenses. But the one thing I do see people do is they sometimes wait until they know where the crop insurance planting time price guarantee is so they know exactly where they can hedge their risk against. They know where prices are uh, an insurable price guarantees at. So that's why I do see some people wait until February 15th or thereabouts. And we tend to see leases run from March 1 through the following February 28th or 29th if it's a leap year. If you're asking yourself the question, what good is this 2022 information for 2023? Well, the first thing I would challenge you to think about is how do your cash rents that you are currently paying stack up against where the 2022 rates are at? If you're already at the highest of the high end and you want more cash rent for 2023, I don't know if you're gonna see quite as much as if you're somebody that's even below the low of the low, uh, depending on where you're at in that, that can have an influence on some of that. All right, next question. Are cash rental rates for privately irrigated or center pivot irrigated cash uh, land, are they only for the irrigated portion? Well, as any good economist says, it always depends. What I tend to see in the Eastern part of the state, it sometimes also includes the dryland corners, especially if you're in some of these areas where it's exceptional land. I do feel it is appropriate to be charging for the type of land. So if you have an irrigated quarter and you're only irrigating 120 acres, but you have a 160 acres, uh, irrigate 128 acres, I do feel it's appropriate to be charging just for the irrigated rate on the irrigated land. The farther west you move, the more common I do feel it is that we see a split between the irrigated and dry land. But given how high irrigated rates are getting, charging a separate dry land cash rent for the dry land corners is probably appropriate. Some folks want an overall average for the property. I do see some people kind of create a weighted average where they account for the dry land acres in addition to the irrigated, sum them together and divided by the overall number of acres. Next question, does somebody out there have a cash lease, uh, flex lease arrangement for irrigated cropland? If you take a look at that website I mentioned here, that aglease101.org, you can, there's free educational pamphlets on flex leases and also on their uh, cash lease forms for crops. They have some verbiage in there on how to set one up. Next question that we had was, when will our 2023, uh, so you inherited the farm, so now what program be scheduled? Um, I don't know if we necessarily have any planned at this time. I can tell you that Alan Benalik and I will be doing the land management meeting series this upcoming fall, late fall, winter. It's going to be focusing on uh, carbon credits. In addition to carbon credits, Alan always talks about his farm succession. And I know Alan throughout the year uh, actively plans and has different types of farm inheritance, farm succession programs. Um, Get in touch with him, he can point you in the direction, and the next time he'll have some things planned. Okay, we had a comment. All right, I think I knocked out all the question and answer. Let's briefly run through the chat questions. Uh, there was a comment made on that the land value should probably be made on the uh, logarithmic scale. Yeah, that's one way to set the chart up. Try to put it the most easy way possible for people to understand. Uh, the question on 1031 exchanges, do you have to have like an arm's length transaction? 
I don't know a lot about the 1031 exchanges. I would address that to either an accountant or an attorney. My knowledge is, is that you can sell one property. I don't know if that when you sell that property, if it has to be an arm's length or when you purchase another like kind property, if it has to be an arm's length. But I know you can buy and sell properties in a way you're almost trading for the land. Um, I think that uh, pretty well wraps up some of the topics we covered. I know this is always a lot to take in, especially if you're sitting there. If you got questions, uh, reach out to myself. Uh, Jessica Groskopf is out in Scotts Bluff. Alan Vanalek is in Lincoln. Ronis McClure feels a little bit more on the customer race and the crop. It's reached out to the team that we have here at the University of Nebraska. And um, please uh, interact with your local office as well. If you don't do the computer thing, please reach out to them. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out as we wrap up here, uh, Brian had a note here that I needed to address quickly. Um, please, please uh, take a look at the Center for Agricultural Profitability website at cap.unl.edu. You can find archived programs on there in addition to the other resources I mentioned. And uh, the next presentation we'll be having next Thursday, we'll be taking a look at preconditioning strategies to prepare for the weaning of cattle. So a lot of drought issues going on. How do we handle some of those things? And um, please click the link in the chat box if you want to provide any feedback on this presentation, what you're looking for in the future. Be sure to let us know. So with that, I am going to go ahead and end the presentation, but we thank everyone for joining today. Greatly appreciate um, you joining us. And it looks like we had a really good, I recognize a few names in the crowd, but uh, Thanks once again for joining us and let us know if we can do anything for you. So take care.